Um, we are going to be starting a new sermon series today that's going to take us through the beginning of um, November, actually, called Signs of the Messiah. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be up front about um, where the title came from, give credit where credit is due. Um, so I'm in a PhD program through Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and my, uh, my emphasis is in New Testament, specifically the Gospel of John. And that's what we're going to be spending the, the fall looking at is um, the Gospel of John. And I didn't know this when I signed up for the program, but one of the professors there is a, a, a professor by the name of Dr. Andreas Kostenberger, and he is an expert in the Gospel of John. He's one of the kind of the two premier guys in the Gospel of John. D.A. Carson's the other one, and he studied under D.A. Carson, so it's a thing. Um, but he just put a book out called Signs of the Messiah. This is my plug for it. Um, it's very good. It's very small. It's an introduction to the Gospel of John. Um, that's where I took the title from. I'm just going to give credit. Uh, and some of the stuff we're going to talk about this week is, is from the book. Going forward, it will be less so. But um, he kind of talks about the importance of signs in Scripture, which is what we're going to talk about as an introduction today. So um, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into kind of our topic. And this is kind of an introductory sermon, which is always a little tricky because... It's a sermon talking about what we're going to be doing in sermons coming up. Um, and, uh, and yet it's going to lay groundwork and give us a big picture, kind of so what, for why, why do we even want to look at this. So uh, let's pray and dive into God's word for us today. Heavenly Father, you show yourself to us in various ways and at various times, but most clearly through the person and the work of your son, Jesus. Help us to see who you are, to see Jesus for who he is, and to see ourselves and the world around us through that lens. Show us your truth. Speak to us through your word. May your spirit be our teacher and guide us into all truth, as you promised, Lord Jesus. We ask all of this in Jesus' holy and precious name. So we're going to be spending some time talking about signs. And um, I'm going to just start out with a question, which is, have you ever asked God for a sign? And that could be like, if you want me to do this, Lord, show me, give me a sign. Or, or if you're real, God, give me a sign. Um, and these are somewhat rhetorical questions, but I really want you to think about this. And if you did ask God for a sign, did he give you one? Did he give you, did he, did he, you know, when you're looking for direction, did he give you that direction? Did he, um, you know, did he, if you're, you're saying make yourself real to me, did he do that? And, and what was that sign and how did it help you? Or maybe you're the kind of person that, like, I don't, I don't look for signs. I kind of question that. That whole thing seems a little odd to me. Um, that is completely legitimate as well, by the way. Don't think that you're somehow unspiritual if you're like, I don't know about signs. Some people see signs in, every, you know, in everything. They're like, I, you know, I, I only drank two cups of coffee today. I'm pretty sure that means the Lord wants me to do this. I'm like, what is that? You know, like sometimes we're just stretching, right? And other times, you know, maybe God is trying to get our attention with something and we're just not paying attention. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about this and we're not going to get in deep on this, but he says in 1 Corinthians 1.22, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. And if you look at culturally and historically, this is unbelievably true. Um, Jews and people that are kind of Eastern in their thinking, signs are important. Um, if you look in the Muslim world, more Muslims come to know Christ through signs and dreams and visions than any other way. Because they're open to that. If you hear in the mission field, the idea of miracles and things like that happening happen more, much more often in non-Western countries than in Western countries. Why? Because it means something in that culture. We're Greek. We're Western. We are, like, we are Western through and through. And so sometimes we don't look for signs. Or, or if there are signs, if there is something miraculous, we kind of maybe try to explain it away. We want to understand how does that work. I remember years ago speaking to a, um, a Greek Orthodox priest and we were having a, a, a theological conversation. It was for a class I was taking. 
And I asked him, explain to me your view of the Trinity. And he said, oh, God is three persons, but fully and eternally exists as one perfect God. He is Father, he is Son, he is Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay, so how does that work? And he goes, I don't know, it's a mystery. And I'm like, well, no, 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 how does it work, though? And he said, I don't have an explanation for it. It's a mystery, and if I could explain it, then I think that it might diminish who God is. The fact that it's mysterious is somehow tied to the fact that it's from God. And my Western brain does not like that answer. Now, I'll be honest, as I've gotten older, I've been like, I like that answer. <laughs> it's a good answer. But we want to explain it, right? Uh, it's like an egg. It's like, you know, we use all these analogies and we can't quite t wrap our head around it. That it, there is that mindset. So keep that in mind, but also keep in mind that as we look at the, the text we're looking at here, especially as we look at the New Testament and Jesus' ministry, he is overwhelmingly dealing with a, Greek, a Jewish audience that literally doesn't just say, science means something to us. They demand them. They don't just ask for them. They demand them. If, if this is true, we need some act of power to show us that it's true. Throughout Scripture, God has used signs as a means of communicating truths to people. And I want you to think about the word sign the way that we use the word sign currently. I know we think about signs in the Bible and we might be like, miracles. Okay, get that out of your head for a second because that is not the way the Bible uses the word sign. Now, it's true that miracles fall under the category of signs at times, but a word, the word sign means what in the modern world? It means something that gives you information or something that points you in the right direction, right? So, detour, this way, that's a sign, right? We have a sign that says 55 mile per hour speed limit. That's a sign that gives you information. That is exactly what signs are in the Bible. They are things that point us to some truth, that gives us information, that shows us something or maybe the way to go, or it, it give, it's, it, the whole idea is signs point to some truth. They give information. And throughout Scripture, we see this. Gideon asked God for a sign twice, actually. And the sign was, God, if you are really calling me, Gideon, to lead your people, to deliver your people from the hands of our enemies, give me a sign. And the sign was, is the fleece dry or wet? By the way, was Gideon asking for a sign because of Gideon's great faith in God? No, he was asking for a sign because he didn't want to do it. And when God gave him the sign, he said, ah, I'm not quite sure that I heard from you right, God. Do it again, but do it the opposite way. It was actually a sign of a lack of faith on Gideon's part. Not a sign of faith. This is a common theme in Scripture. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah asked God for a sign that God would indeed heal him when God had promised that he would. Through the prophet Isaiah in 2 Kings, Hezekiah is stricken with... <sighs> Some translations say leprosy. We're not going to get into this. Leprosy didn't exist in those days, the way that we think of leprosy. It was a skin disease. We don't know what it was. We'll just leave it at that. Um, God had afflicted him with some skin disease, and, and, and Hezekiah asked God for healing, and Isaiah said, the Lord will heal you. And Hezekiah says... Show me a sign that this is true. It wasn't because of Hezekiah's great faith. It was actually because he wasn't trusting what Isaiah was saying. But it was a sign of his healing. And God gave him that sign. Moses winds up performing a variety of signs. Um, and I just put one verse there where it specifically says miracles and, and um, signs. Signs and miracles. Signs and wonders in Exodus um, when he is sent by God to deliver his people. So the, the, the ten plagues, they're, call, they're called signs and wonders. But what are they signs of? That the God of Israel is the most powerful God there is, that he is the one and true God, and that the gods of Egypt are nothing. All of them were signs to show the Israelites and the Egyptians that this is true. And then you get to the prophets, the, the, the prophetic books in the Old Testament, and they are full of signs, and I don't mean miracles, though there are occasionally miracles. Overwhelmingly, the prophets use things that the Bible calls signs, and they act them out as ways to illustrate messages. 
of judgment and mercy. Some of them very, very odd. Isaiah went around in his underwear for quite a long time publicly to convey to God's people that God was sending an imminent judgment upon Israel because of their sin. And he says, the Lord said, I want you to go around, strip down nothing but your skivvies. Why? So that the people will know this is how you're going to get led out of here into captivity because you're disobedient and you're not repenting. That was a sign. That's what it's called. Jeremiah uses a variety of sign acts as teaching tools. If you look throughout Jeremiah um, 13, 16, 18, uh, the whole of chapter 19 and 32 all contain various teaching tools where God says, I want you to convey this truth and I want you to do this thing to show that truth. And it was weird things. It was weird things. And that's true of Ezekiel too. Ezekiel was called to enact signs as a way of portending or foretelling Jerusalem siege. In Ezekiel 4, God says, I want you to build a mini scale model version of the city of Jerusalem. And I want you to like wage war against it and be like, oh, I'm attacking it. And I mean, to the people around in the middle of the city. And everybody would have been like, what is going on with Ezekiel? And he's like, he's, he's, uh, as he's doing this, he's saying, the Lord is telling you the city is going to come under siege. It's going to look like this. And they're like, we don't, uh, we don't want to believe that. Just, it seems strange and bizarre, but we know that this is one way that people learn and take in information. It's a teaching tool. It's a, literally their visual aids. Throughout Scripture, the overwhelming purpose of signs is to point people to the truth. Whether that be a teaching aid, some kind of miraculous occurrence, or foretelling an event. I didn't mention this one, but Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 7, probably the one that we are most familiar with in the prophets, King Ahaz, who is a corrupt and wicked king, says, uh, uh, Isaiah prophesies and said, these two kings from uh, Israel and Samaria, are, they're, they're gonna, not going to overtake you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And God, and um, and Ahaz says, I don't know, I don't know. And he says, well, Isaiah says, then ask the Lord for a sign. And, Isaiah, and, and Ahaz is like, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to put, do that to the Lord. And he's like, fine, God's going to give you a sign. That young woman over there, she's going she's gonna to have a child. She's going to give birth to a son. And he'll be called Emmanuel. And before he's old enough to know right from wrong, to eat curds and honey, these two guys that you're worried about, these smoldering stumps, he calls them, They'll be put out. They'll be taken away. God will deliver you from them. But he will bring Assyria upon you. That's the original meaning of the virgin will be with child, give birth to a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. It was a sign for Ahaz that God would do what he said. Again, not something that was happening because of his great faith in the Lord, but actually because of his lack of faith. He was like, you need more than just me to say this, right? I'll show you. I'll show you that it's true. And the result of signs in Scripture should be, should lead us to a greater faith in God. It might be a, a first faith. Maybe it's coming to know the Lord for the first time. Maybe it's, I, I trust in the Lord, but I'm struggling in this, and now I see this sign, and that encourages me in my faith. That is what the intent is. That is the result, but that doesn't always, isn't always the case. As we see in the Gospels, when Jesus performs miracles and signs, some people come to faith in him, and other people want to kill him because of it. And that's actually what our focus is going to be on, is on Jesus as the sign giver. In the Gospels, Jesus is often asked to perform signs as proof of his claims. And again, just like in the Old Testament, this is not normally due to the desire of the people asking to trust Jesus. They're like, we really want to believe you, just show us. But rather as a means of trying to discredit him. That is the most common reason people are asking Jesus for signs. They're like, we don't believe you and the claims that you're making. So... Uh, 
Give us a sign. Show us that this is real. It's kind of goading them on. And an example of this is from Matthew chapter 16. It says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus. This is the two kind of ruling religious parties. And they tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. By the way, I was translating this from a Greek class when I was in seminary. And I, I asked my professor, can I translate it? with a, a modern idiom for that. And she's like, what's the idiom? I said, well, you say red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. And she's like, that's great. It won't apply in 20 years or 100 years or different culture. I'm like, it's true. But that is what Jesus was getting at, that expression, right? He's like, you say that, and you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, he says this into the context of them saying, we demand a sign to show that you are who you claim to be. And he goes, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that looks for a sign. He doesn't say it in a pot. He's like, oh, yes, for a sign, sure. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Let me do something for you. He says, you're asking for this because you're wicked and adulterous. You're looking for a reason not to believe. He says, but none will be given it, that is, this wicked and adulterous nation, uh, generation, except the sign of Jonah. And then Jesus left them and went away. Now you might say, wait a second. Didn't Jesus perform a whole bunch of signs? Didn't he just say he was only going to perform one, the sign of Jonah? No, he's saying to this generation, the generation he's speaking to, the ones that will not believe. He doesn't mean everybody, but he's saying, I'm going to give you a sign. You want a sign? Just like Jonah was in the belly of a, a great fish for three days and three nights and then came out again. So the Son of Man will go into the belly of the earth for three days and then come back to life. Because for them, that was going to be the only thing that might convince them. Now, that's not to say that Jesus didn't perform other signs. He absolutely did. But he's saying to this group in this context, he's like, nothing short of resurrection is going to even come close to convincing you. But Jesus did perform signs as proof of his claims. He did it all the time. Like the prophets, he used them as teaching tools to point people to the truth at times. One of the few miracles that is recorded in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks. But he uses that as a teaching tool later on when he says, I am the bread of life. And like Moses, he used them to display the power of God at work through him. In fact, they said, Moses, in that particular example, Moses gave us bread from heaven. Can't you do the same thing? You've got to be as, at least as powerful as Moses. To which Jesus, by the way, replies, huh, you don't know scripture very well. Moses did not give them bread. God gave them bread. And in this process of using these signs as displays of power, Jesus brings about deliverance, healing, and even warns of judgment. Just like the prophets. Just like Moses. Now, Jesus' use of signs is actually displayed the most clearly in one section of the Bible which is the Gospel of John. Overwhelmingly, the Gospel of John has more references to signs than the rest of the, the Bible put together. The term sign, in Greek, the word is simonion, if you care. Um, it appears in the other Gospels, but infrequently. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the idea of signs is so central that Jesus is never recorded as performing a miracle in the Gospel of John. Now you might say, that's not true. He, re he performed miracles. He raised Lazarus. They're not called miracles. They're called signs. On a couple of occasions, they're called miraculous signs. But actually, that's a translational choice. It's actually probably better understood to say signs of power. 
They're so central that that is what John says. Every thing that Jesus does, all these public acts, he calls them signs. Jesus gives the people signs. And those are just a few of the um, references in the Gospel of John to the use of sign language, no pun intended. From the very beginning, what is the first uh, miracle that we have recorded in Scripture of Jesus doing? Jesus turning water into wine in a wedding feast in Cana. John chapter 2. It's in John chapter 2, 11. It says this is the first sign that Jesus performed. But if you read carefully, it says while he was in Cana. doesn't mean it was the first thing he ever, miraculous thing he did. It was just the first one he did while he was there. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a, in a couple weeks. And not everything in the Gospel of John that is called a sign is miraculous. There are times that th- Jesus does things like clear the temple, and that is called a sign. Because it's not just about saying, look, look at what I can do. He's like, I'm trying to show you some truth. I'm using this to point to a truth. The truth is about who I am and what I've come to do. In fact, if you look at the end of the Gospel of John, right before the very last chapter, kind of the prologue, um, or postlude, so to speak, of John. John 21 is kind of an after, like, and this is what happened later. John chapter 20, at the very end, John says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are, these are written that you may believe, and it depends on which translation you have here, but I'm going to actually use this author's translation, which if you get into the Greek of this, um, is probably the most accurate translation I've seen. And other people I've interacted with have said, yeah, that, that gets, captures the language the best. <clears throat> that you may believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is, should say, is Jesus. Not the Jesus, I apologize. And that by believing you may have life in his name. John tells us the most clearly in all of Scripture why he wrote what he wrote. John states his purpose in writing his Gospels to present Jesus' messianic claims. That the Messiah, the Son of God, the Davidic King, the promised one from God, is Jesus. And he uses signs as evidential proof. He says, I picked a handful of signs of all the things that Jesus did. He did a lot of signs. A lot. A lot more. In fact, he says a little bit later, he goes, if I were to write down all the things that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. He said, but I'm going to be selective and I'm going to pick a handful of them. Seven, to be precise. And there's an argument that there's eight, but we'll talk about that when the time comes. Pointing to the fact that Jesus is who he claims to be. That that if you look at this, these signs, they point to who Jesus is. And they will show you that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God. And not just for informational purposes. He makes it clear that it is belief or faith in Jesus as Messiah that gives eternal life. That the purpose, his purpose in writing his gospel is that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Messiah, the Son of God, is Jesus. And that by believing we would have life, real life in his name. In fact, the favorite term in the Gospel of John for what Jesus offers is life or eternal life. Because that is why John wrote what he wrote. And to give you just a a little snippet of history on this, if you're unfamiliar with this, we have four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is pretty, pretty universally 
um, acknowledged by um, people that study this stuff, study history and, and, and texts and all this kind of stuff, that of the four Gospels, the first to be written was actually Mark. Um, uh, the early church fathers tell us that Mark wrote his Gospel based off the preaching of Peter. By the way, the, uh, the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark is John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas that we meet in the book of Acts. He was with Peter during his last days preaching in Rome before he was arrested and crucified upside down for his faith in Christ. And Mark wrote down what J Peter had been preaching about Jesus in his gospel. Then Matthew and Luke come along and they take what Mark has, uh, has writ uh, have written, they, they interview other people, they're led by the Holy Spirit, and they write their gospels with specific audiences in mind. Matthew wrote to Jews. The Gospel of Matthew is overwhelmingly a Jewish Gospel. And if you, don't, if you need evidence of that, all you have to do is look at the genealogy. Because the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew wants to show that he is a child of Abraham. That is the most important thing. That he is a child of Abraham, that he is a child of, of David. That is the most important thing, because that matters to Jews. And you look at Luke's genealogy of Jesus, and Luke said, I interviewed every eyewitness I could find to make sure that everything I'm writing down is legitimate. And in Luke's gospel, the genealogy of Jesus doesn't stop at Abraham. It goes back to Adam. Why? Because he's writing to Gentiles. And to Gentiles, Abraham is a footnote in history. But for everybody, Adam is of significance. You'll also notice if you read Luke's gospel, and you see Jewish things being described in great detail, you'd say, well, that would tell me that it's written to Jews. No, it doesn't. It means it's written to non-Jews. You don't have to tell Jews what Passover is. They know. You have to tell non-Jews what Passover is. So Luke goes into the, the point of explaining it to the non-Jews reading his, his work. And you're like, that's all interesting. What does that have to do with John? Well, interestingly enough, John was the youngest of Jesus' disciples. Um, it is... It is uh, kind of guessed that he was somewhere between the ages of 14 and 16 when he started following Jesus. He was also the last of the disciples to be alive. And every piece of historical and extra-biblical and biblical evidence that we have about the writing of the Gospel of John is that John wrote it towards the end of his life after Matthew, Mark, and Luke were already written and probably in somewhat of circulation. Keep in mind, we didn't have books back then. Right? How did you get a copy of one of the books of the Bible? You didn't go down to the store and buy it. They were scrolls, or sometimes codexes, sometimes something like this, but they were expensive. They had to be hand copied. So only, you know, maybe a church would own one of the four. They'd have a copy of one of the four if they were, they were real lucky. But John had read the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. At least Mark. And we're told by early church fathers, actually we're told by somebody um, that would have known John personally, or at least had secondhand, um, pretty close secondhand knowledge of him, that John wrote his gospel, and he calls it a spiritual gospel. That he wrote keeping in mind what the other gospel writers had written, but basically to fill in the gap and tell some of the stories they didn't tell, but with this very specific goal in mind. And the goal was out of the gate to tell you who Jesus is. I've always said this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are great. They're gospels that tell the story of Jesus, and they say, kind of figure out who he is. Read the stories, figure it out. Come to your own conclusions, so to speak. John does not do that. John says in the beginning, in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the very beginning. From the very opening words of his gospel, he says, Jesus is God and always has been. It is most clear in the gospel of John all the claims of Jesus. And then John uses all of the signs of Jesus to say, look, they, they show us for, for certain that what he is saying is true, that what he is saying is true. 
His gospel was written to show us the truth, uh, show us that truth, that eternal life comes through belief in Jesus, in both the person and the work of Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 11, in part of the farewell discourse, Jesus says, believe me when I say to you, uh, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. The works there is very clearly an evidence to the, the, the signs he's been performing. He says, if you don't believe me, and he's talking to his disciples, at least you've seen the things I've been doing. If they don't point to who I am, then don't believe me. By the way, an interesting note, we'll get into this later, but one of probably, we would say, the most convincing arguments for Jesus' claim to be God is his resurrection of the dead, right? Specifically Lazarus, right? That's like, that's like no pun intended, the nail out of the coffin, right? And yet it's, the story of Lazarus only appears in the Gospel of John. It does not appear in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. There's a historical reason probably for that, and we'll talk about that when we come to that. But John wrote what he wrote to point us, to give us evidence, to give us proof that Jesus is who he claims to be. So that's John's purpose. Our purpose, why are we going to be spending the next couple months looking at this? Well, we're going to spend the next few months looking at the seven signs that John lays out for the identity of Jesus. And these, these are the signs that that the Gospel of John clearly says are signs. Uh, turning water to wine, we'll talk about that in two weeks. Clearing the temple, healing the official son, healing the lame man, feeding the 5,000, healing the blind man, and raising Lazarus. Those are, those are the seven. By the way, um, if you know this or not, the Gospel of John is the only Gospel that also talks about Jesus walking on the water. Now, the other Gospels talk about him calming the storm, but him walking on the water, that happens in John chapter 6. It is not listed as a sign. It is stated as just a matter of fact that Jesus did. And if you read carefully, you know why Jesus walked on water? Because it was convenient. In John chapter 6, the beginning of the chapter, he feeds the 5,000, and then he goes away by himself. He's like, they want to take him and make him king, and he's like, I'm not having anything to do with that. And he goes by himself and to be alone with his father on a mountainside. His disciples don't know where he went. They think he went across the Sea of Galilee. So they get in a boat, and they start going across the Sea of Galilee, thinking he's already on the other side. And then Jesus goes down, and he's like, oh, they already left. Okay, well, it's just going to be easier for me to walk across the lake than to go around it. So he does. And not in a still, tepid lake. He goes across in a storm. And he just walks across and gets in the boat. And they're like, what is going on? And they're like, it's, he's like, it's me. Just calm down. Gets in the boat. They're on the other side of the lake. It's, it's, it's like a side story. Why would... Why would it, it, just, it, it almost seems bizarre that they don't make a bigger deal about it. John just kind of throws it out. Yeah, Jesus did that too. And at the end, he makes a comment. He's like, man, if I put everything in here Jesus did, we wouldn't have books. We, I'd be, I'd be, every book would be about Jesus in the whole world. Because he did so much stuff. But he says, I'm selecting these seven to point to the truth of who Jesus is. And when we look at these signs, some of which are miraculous, some of them are not, it makes a clear paints a clear image of who Jesus is. Along with that, John tells us that looking at these signs helps our faith. He says, but, but these are written that you may believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is Jesus, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's a whole debate over this, and we're not going to get into this in too great of depth, but there's a whole debate because there's a textual variant in the word believe there without getting into, deep into this, basically some ancient manuscripts say something to the effect of start believing, and some say continue believing. And actually, the, which belief is it is not important. Because 
the way that verbs work in Greek and all this other stuff, um, John would be like, why are you splitting hairs about this? Faith is enduring faith or it's no faith at all. Real faith must be enduring faith. So it doesn't matter if it's faith that, it, it could be faith where it's the kind of faith where like, hey, I just started believing in Jesus. It could be faith of saying, I already believed in Jesus, but this is strengthening my faith. It doesn't matter. It's still faith. It's enduring faith. And, and in fact, I would argue that the gospel writers in general don't make this, that distinction that we make. We make this great distinction between what we call discipleship and evangelism. I don't think Jesus makes that distinction. Jesus doesn't say, come to know me. He says, he doesn't say that to one group and to the other group, you guys already know me. I guess grow in your faith or something. I don't know. No, he says to everybody, come and follow me. Yeah, but I don't know who you are. You'll figure it out. That's what he did with Peter. He meets Peter and he says, leave your stuff behind. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Peter doesn't know who this guy is. He knows he claimed to be Messiah, but he has no reason to believe that. It's not until almost three years later that Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? He goes, you are the son of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right. But you didn't come up to that conclusion on your own. The Holy Spirit gave you that answer. We sometimes make the mistake of saying that there's evangelism, that's talk, telling people who don't know Jesus about Jesus, and then we try to like, come to know Jesus. And then there's, then there's the real work of like growing in our faith, discipleship. Jesus doesn't call anyone to anything other than discipleship. Everyone's called to be a disciple. And it might be grow in your faith, but if you don't have any faith, you still got to grow. But we're also going to spend one week at the end of this struggling and wrestling with something that Jesus says uniquely in the Gospel of John about signs and their, our interaction with them. Something that I'll be honest, I think we don't struggle with. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. We're going to wrestle with that. It's a tough statement that Jesus makes. I don't think that the church really deals with. But we're going to, we're going to wrestle with it. So here's our so what. Are we looking at the evidence of who Jesus is? Is it leading us to a deeper, enduring faith in him? And I, and I would go a step further and say, the more that we understand the claims of who Jesus is and understand how the things that he did point to the truth of who he is, it is so much easier when I'm talking to my 12-year-old son and, he's, and we're reading through John together right now and he says, I don't understand this. And I'd say, okay, so when Jesus did this, he was trying to show them this. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. It's like eye-opening. And for someone who is, whether they're struggling with their faith or they don't have faith in Jesus, us being able to say, I understand why Jesus turned water into wine. It wasn't because he was like a party monster. He was making a claim. He was trying to show a truth about who he is. It wasn't arbitrary. He was trying to convey to his disciples, something is happening in front of you. And they had to understand that. To, they would have understood that in a way that we might not. So we're going to dive into that to look at what that means. This is our meditation verse for this week. This has become one of my favorite verses as of late because I've been doing a lot of study in John. And so much of John comes down to this statement. But these are written that you may believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is Jesus. And that by believing you may have life in his name. I want us to chew on that this week. What does that mean for the Messiah, the Son of God, if Jesus is who he claims to be? What does that mean? What does that mean?